And it is a wonderful Monday morning. Good morning to all of you. I guess we should. Oh, I I, I got to show you here in the background. There, I have I have a, a Picasso coming up in my family. That was by Riley, my great granddaughter. It is gorgeous. It is planted in a place of. Uh, We'll get it framed and we'll get it hung and put lights on it and all of that. And well, at any rate, good morning to everybody. I pray you had a great and wonderful weekend. I certainly did. And I had a great time with my kids here a little bit. I'm going to meet up with Laura and Chris before they head back for Spokane. Uh, have a little uh, something with them before they go back. But we had a great time with our family. And I pray you guys all had a great weekend too. Let's see who all is up here. Who we got? Miss Carolyn, good morning to you. It is such a good day and it is so good to see you up there this morning. Miss Helen, it is always great to have you with us. God bless you. Miss Alyssa, oh, Kara, Cam, Cody, Robbie, all of you, what? You missed out on a weekend of camping, but you filled it with a baseball tournament for Cameron and Cody had a sick day, got a cold. Josh has too. Went to work, came home tonight, this morning. Uh, all he's all full was yesterday. But uh, so let's pray for them. Let's pray for Cody. Get him all well and all good. Okay. There's my Miss Sue. Good morning, Miss Sue. It's good to see you, Miss Terry. Good morning, everyone. What an amazing service we had yesterday. Praise our heavenly Father. Amen. 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 And amen. Uh, just gonna give you guys kind of a, a of course. We, we, we baptized Michael yesterday. We had a great time in the service. Uh, we had uh, uh, we had Daniel and uh, and uh, uh, Savannah come forward professing their faith in Christ, coming forward to be baptized, which we will do uh, here in a couple of weeks on uh, the second of July. And uh, many of you went out while I praying for me while I was uh, uh, talking with uh, with Mia. Uh, there at the front, and uh, just to let you all know, because we still had about 25 or you know so people still hanging around when I got done, and I called everybody's attention, and they they came in, and and I said, ask Mia if she would like to share what she did, and she said, I asked Jesus to forgive me all my sins, come into my life, and take control, and to save me, and uh, I want to be baptized on my birthday, all of that, so. Uh, uh, we rejoiced in that, and uh, then on the 9th of July, which is our birthday, we will baptize. Boy, God was, God just moved in a in a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful way, and uh, just just humbled by what God is doing, uh, you know, in and through our fellowship and with our our our. Our sister churches out there. I see Raphael up there this morning. I pray you had a great weekend, uh, uh, Pastor Raphael, and, and things went well. I do know that uh, we've ordered the material. It's all being sent down, and uh, uh, we're anxious for what God is going to do and what he is doing in your life and in your ministry. May God bless you, my friend. As well as Pastor Sadiq uh, up there in uh, in South India, God bless you. A hard place. Uh, a lot of opposition. Pray for him. Pray for his street pastors that he's got out there. Pray that I'll have a, a way to, to train and, and help equip them. Uh, they don't have all the technology in that area uh, that uh, others do. So we've got to find a way to do this. So please pray for that. Uh, pray for uh, Pastor Luciano and Grace Baptist uh, uh, there in, uh, in, in Mindanao, uh, in Davu City. Uh, they got an upcoming project at Christmas time uh, where they're going to be giving food baskets out to, to children for their families and stuff and presenting the gospel. Pray for that. Uh, it's a major outreach in that area to reach people with the gospel. So a lot of stuff going on. God is blessing. And every time I turn around, God, you know, somebody's telling me something else that God is doing. God is moving in our day. Uh, Mr. Rick, good morning to you. It is good to see you. God is great and marvelous and wonderful all the time, all the time. God is wonderful and God bless you. Miss Lena, I'm sure you're out there with your lovely husband. So God bless you. Miss Sherry says, good 
good morning, dear brothers and sisters. Let the whole being sing his praise with great joy. Amen. And there's Miss Debbie. You're not happy today, are you, Debbie? Uh, good morning, everyone. Adam, Mia, and I uh, are present. Good morning, Adam. I don't know that we've met, but God bless you. Good morning to have you. Mia, love you. Love you. Love you what God is doing in your life, young lady. Uh, our present and excited for today's study, Avery has a migraine. We'll pray for her, but we'll watch later today. We love you all so much. Pastor Raphael, you're welcome. God bless you. Alyssa, uh, her picture is wonderful. Yes, it is. She's very talented, extremely talented. Uh, and, uh, of course, we all know that. <laughs> we love you too, Debbie. God bless. God bless. Oh, Miss Terry, I'll remind everybody here uh, the 1st of uh, July, that Saturday, will be the church picnic. So put that on your calendar. Uh, what time are we going to start? Type that in there for me so I got it. I think it's 1, but uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll put that in there. But uh, our church picnic, that Saturday. Uh, and then on that Sunday, uh, we're going to baptize uh, uh, Daniel and, and uh, uh, Savannah. And we're going to just... Have a great time. What a celebration. 1 p.m. I was right. All right. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that we can come together today and, and surround ourselves with your word. Immerse ourselves in it. God, we need a word from you. We need to hear from you. God, nobody needs to hear from me, but we all need to hear from you. So I pray, Lord, that you will open our ears and our eyes that we would see, make us like a Peter, uh, that, Lord, uh, we understand what the Father's saying. Uh, make us like a Dorcas, Lord, where, where you just open our heart uh, uh, to the Word of God. And we just thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you are working in such marvelous way. Thank you. Lord, for the, the testimony, the witness presented to us by, by Daniel and Savannah. And thank you, O oh God, for moving upon Mia's heart and life and drawing her into that wonderful, wonderful relationship with you. Father, I just pray that you will continue to open her understanding more and more every day. Thank you, Lord, uh, for uh, just, just the blessing of being this incredible family, reaching out across the world, Lord, in, 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 in just a blessing. Thank you. Father, I do pray for Cody that you'll uh, take this summer cold away. I'm Same for Joshua, Father. Uh, bad time of year to get a cold, Father. So we lift them up and we pray for him. Pray for Avery's uh, migraine that you'll take that away. I know how devastating those can be. I think of Cynthia. She's waiting now for her surgery uh, coming up uh, here in just a couple of weeks, Lord. And I just pray that you'll get her strength, you know, strength her more and more each day as uh, she comes up to that surgery time. God, we love you. And now, Lord, we're anxious for what you had for us in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you've got your, uh, uh, your, your notepads that you write notes on, you've got your Bible open to Mark 8, that's where we are. Uh, we ended last week looking at uh, a very unpopular teaching. You remember Peter, he had made his great confession that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, and uh, Jesus, you know, really, he gives him an A plus for that. You know, flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, Simon, uh, Peter, but, uh, but my Father in heaven, yeah, and you're Peter. Uh, but upon this rock, this, 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 this Petra, this, this foundational rock, this, this granite wall, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Uh, Mark uh, tells us that uh, his church, uh, the church uh, that, that Christ founded with his own life, uh, is uh, built upon that, sacri that sacrificial death uh, that he, uh, of, of, uh, of the cross, and that his blood will conquer the very gates of hell. I remember they're standing there, Caesarea Philippi, I believe the scripture certainly indicates that, and maybe looking where that water comes up out of the ground, and, and the people believe that was the gates of Hades, and uh, he said not even the gates of hell will prevail against it. And of course, that great confession of Peter's is the confession of the church. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Uh, in verse 31 of Mark 8, he says that he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. But after that, uh, after three days, to rise again. 
as Peter declares Jesus to be the Messiah, then Christ moves in, capitalizing on that teaching moment, and explains to them what is going to take place, what the very outcome of his ministry is going to be. He tells his disciples that because he's the Messiah, uh, there will be four things that will happen, that he must suffer many things, which we know he did. Uh, he'll be rejected by religious leaders who will also lead the people to reject him, that he will be killed, uh, crucified on the cross, but after three days he will rise again. In each of these statements, the Lord uses the infinitive uh, voice, which shows that this is the result. This is the end result of, of my ministry. Uh, I've been out here preaching the gospel. I've been raising the dead, healing the sick, uh, giving sight to the blind, voice to the, uh, the dumb, hearing to the, uh, to the deaf. I've been giving the lame legs to walk and you know, the, uh, the shriveled hands. You know. So he's, his ministry is out there. He's preaching the good news. Uh, he's, he's watching the captives be released, if you will, from the prisons of sin. But he said the end result of all of this that you've witnessed, that you've been a part of, is my death, is my rejection, uh, my, my, my ultimate torture, and my death upon the cross. Now, uh, this is like saying to the disciples, you've seen all of this, but I want you to see where all of this is leading. It's the first time. Now, he's taught several times on the fact that he was going to suffer and die. You know, tear this temple down and I'll build it up in three days, speaking of his body. He's, he, he's, he's cloaked it. He's veiled that teaching of the cross, the suffering and uh, the passion of the Christ. He's veiled it, but now he comes out with an open declara declaration uh, that uh, there was coming a time when he would suffer at the hands of religious leaders and that he would, uh, would die. This, is, of course, didn't set well. You can imagine. It didn't set well with the disciples. They already had firmly in their mind what his role as Messiah was to be. And it wasn't to suffer. It wasn't to be rejected. It wasn't to be killed. That is not the, the mindset of what the Messiah was going to do. You know, the Messiah was to raise and amass this great army that would drive out the oppressors and establish once again David's golden rule, his glorious rule upon his throne. And they were all going to rule alongside him. The idea of the cross and Christ's death appeared to be unthinkable to them. So why was his death and resurrection a divine necessity? Now we talk a lot about this, but I, I, I kind of agree with uh, uh, the statement that we need to preach the gospel to ourselves every day, lest we uh, get too built up in, in, in pride and think that we had something to do with it. Well, it's a divine necessity because God's justice, you know, requires it. God's justice required legal satisfaction for the grace of, of forgiveness to be given. You and I couldn't pay that debt. You and I, sin had built up this, this great debt. Even one sin is, is, is an eternal debt that we are unable to pay. We don't have the ability. We don't have the resources we can. Uh, because, you know, we as, as, as sinful men and, and, and women aren't capable of it. But God's justice still requires legal satisfaction for the grace of forgiveness to be given to anybody. And a long string of animal sacrifices throughout the Old Testament bear witness uh, to the satisfaction of God's justice. Each one, each one was foreshadowing. Each one was pointing toward getting their eyes forward to the time when the Lamb of God would bear the weight of divine justice upon the cross. They didn't understand it. It was a mystery to them. Uh, they knew something better was promised out there. They didn't know what it was, uh, but uh, God's got to reveal it to them. You see, Jesus Christ is uh, that better sacrifice. The writer who wrote his letter to the Hebrew believers in Rome explains it in terms of uh, the old sacrifice and the perfect sacrifice. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, it says, For the law since it has only a shadow of good things to come, 
and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. You see what he says? Everything here is in shadow. And, and you know what that is. You know what it is. I, I like to use the idea of, of a blue screen or a silk screen. You all know what a silk screen I hope you do. If you go to a theater and uh, there's this silky screen over and all the players are behind it, everything is in shadow. You can see movements and you can see, uh, uh, you can see silhouettes of people, but you can't make out who they are and, and, and everything. But when that silk screen is pulled back, then you can see clearly everything that is on the stage. Well, in the Old Testament, all of these Old Testament sacrifices, they were behind the silk screen. They knew something more was back there, something more perfect, something you know that, that would come into focus, uh, but they didn't exactly know what it was. It was still a mystery. And Jesus is pulling that silk screen back and saying, you know, here's the real, it's me. Now, there was certainly plenty of indication in Scripture what it would be, but they missed it. In verse 4 of Hebrews 10, he explains that it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin, at least permanently. It did in the Old Testament temporarily, but had to be repeated over and over and over again. So these were sacrifices that had to be continually uh, uh, repeated. And each and every time there was a sacrifice under the Old Covenant, they pointed gloriously uh, to the promised Messiah, to the promised one who would come. Then there's this glorious explanation in Hebrews 10. If you want to look at it, you can write that down, go back and read it later. But it says, after saying sacrifices and uh, offerings and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, uh, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first, the old covenant. He takes all of that away to establish the second, the new covenant. By this will we be sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now remember when we were back in Romans 3, we discussed this at some length on a Sunday morning. In Romans 3, 25 and 26, it says, Whom God displayed publicly, this Jesus, this Christ, as a propitiation in his blood through faith. That's a great word, propitiation. We're going to look at it. This was to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time that he might be just and the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus. Angel is with us now. Good morning, Angel. I hope you're feeling better. Uh, the Lord's blessing continue to flow through my family. I am so humble and joy. Yes, can't help but praise him. Wow, ain't that the truth? So let's let's take a look at this word, propitiation. How many of you use that, you know, on a daily basis? It's a word that you, 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 you find used. How many of you have ever used that word? Okay, so what does it mean? Well, to propitiate something means to remove the wrath by the offering of a sacrifice. You see, God couldn't forgive anyone without his own justice first being satisfied. And that he did through Christ's death on the cross for all who would trust his son. You see, in a, in a normal state. In, in, in the normal, that word would be used, uh, I am the offending party, and I want to make things right with the one that I offended. So I would bring something to propitiate, to satisfy the anger of the person that, that I created. I would bring the offering. I would bring the gift. I would bring that which would propitiate. In this case, I, can't, I don't have that ability. Because anything I would bring would be even a further offense because it would be tainted by my own sin. Because God is holy and just and righteous. So he sent his son. And his son became that very propitiation, that which satisfied the divine wrath of God because of my sin. He never sinned, never did anything wrong. Went to the cross and died as the innocent lamb of God. And 
he propitiated. In other words, when you look at it, God is the one that brought the very gift that satisfied his own wrath. Get your mind around that. That's you know every time I I, I think of, of of people who who think that they uh, they can do something to appease God and and I can bring him anything that's gonna you know you know affect some of my forgiveness I I think don't you realize God is the offended party and God Himself gave the gift necessary to satisfy that own wrath because I was incapable God did it. It's all about him. God did it. The message of the gospel is the vicarious, substitutionary atonement of Christ on the cross. Big words there. Vicarious means that Jesus' death on the cross was our death for sin. Substitution means that, that, that he substituted himself. We know what a substitute is. Uh, any any anybody that's gone to school knows that when the teacher's sick and out, a substitute stands in her place. Well, it's the same thing. I couldn't do anything to uh, appease the wrath of God, so a substitute stepped in my place. When he died, there upon the cross, as we've said over and over, we died with him. By substitution, we mean that Jesus took our place paid the penalty for our sins. And by atonement, we mean that Jesus is paying. In paying for our sin, has made us right with God. And if we'll believe in him, as, as, as I witnessed Mia doing yesterday, as I witnessed Emmanuel or or Michael or you know as I've witnessed these these folks recently doing putting their faith their whole trust believing in the death burial resurrection of Jesus Christ and his his his, his death in their behalf when we believe it what he did on the cross becomes effective for us his death for our sin cannot be left out of any gospel message for that is the gospel because without his death on the cross we would not receive the forgiveness of sin and that's why Jesus came and that's why Jesus rebukes Peter look at chapter 8 Mark 8 verse 31 and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests, the scribes, and be killed and after three days rise again. And be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes. These were the three groups that made up the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court, if you will. And the elders were prominent lay people on the council. The chief priests were the hierarchy and the scribes were the doctors of the law. He's already rejected by many of them, and he recognized that almost all of them would turn against him. What Jesus appears to be saying, however, is that all the Jewish religious leaders will come together to condemn him. Not just those who came from these groups and formed part of the official greater Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, but you also have uh, the party of, the, uh, the, you know, of Herod. You've got you know, Herod's group that's out to kill him. We have here an ad evidence of how the actual words of Jesus are preserved and be killed. It would have been easy to alter it to crucified, especially in light of verse 34, when we get there. The fact that crucifixion was the normal death under Roman law for high treason. But they didn't change it. These are Peter's words through Mark. Although there are norm, numerous differing concepts of what the Messiah would do among the nations, uh, the nation of Israel at the time, one of the most common was that he would be a great deliverer from the oppression of the Roman occupation. And those who dominated the area and forbid Israel to be a any more than, than, than a people who had uh, to jump every time uh, Rome snapped its fingers. 
most people, including the twelve, were expecting a victorious Messiah. By all conventional understanding, the Jewish understanding of the Christ, the Messiah, was that he would bring deliverance through conquest. Here Jesus explains that he would bring deliverance through the cross, and he would achieve victory through his suffering. He would take up the cross and not the crown. Longing for deliverance from uh, this setup cannot uh, be overemphasized if we are to understand Peter's horror at hearing these words. After three days, I will rise again. The idea of a third uh, day resurrection is, is taken directly out of Hosea. That great little prophecy in Hosea, in Hosea 6, 1 and 2, it says, uh, I'm a little behind on my clicking forward, aren't I? It says, come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, but we, he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us. He will revive us after two days, and he will rise us up on the third, that we may live before him. Both Matthew and Luke interpret the three days of Mark as the third day, interpreted in the light of the suffering servant Isaiah. Indeed, the servant's task could only be fulfilled by resurrection. How else could he receive the spoils of victory that we see and we read about in Isaiah 53, verse 12? But look at verse 32. And while, and, and he, was, he was stating the matter plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Get this picture. Put this squarely in your mind. Jesus is talking about you know, the necessity of his death and resurrection. And Peter goes, <clears throat> Come here, Jesus. Takes him by the arm and leads him away from the group. And I think in quiet, hushed tones, he's doing this. Don't you say, he's rebuking Jesus. I mean, let's face it, Peter got one test right in his life to this point. And that just happened. And he thinks he's got it all figured out. So he's going to step up, student to teacher, and straighten the teacher out. The tense of the Greek verb plainly here is such that it should be translated, he continued saying this plainly. In other words, he is emphasizing and emphasizing and emphasizing. He doesn't want them to miss out on what he's saying. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. I'm going to raise the third day. This brief comment clearly indicates that Mark allows no possibility of Jesus being understood. It's kind of like, you know, we always told our kids, the reason that, that God gave kids ears is they're good handles. Have you ever heard that, Alyssa? They're good handles. You see, you grab a hold of them and say, listen up, watch my lips. And that's what he's doing. He's making it very plain. I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. It is a divine imperative, a necessity, that I suffer at the hands of these evil men, that I be rejected, that I be killed, and I will raise in the third day. What Jesus said was no parable. He didn't cloak it in any kind of flowery language or, or imagery that needed to be understood in spiritual terms for the truth to be made known. He's telling a like it is. He records that Jesus spoke of his own suffering plainly, and it seems obvious also that the disciples understood that, uh, it, it, that, this, uh, uh, that this way of judging was coming from Peter as a response for Peter truly understanding what Jesus was saying. Jesus did, Peter didn't want to make a, an open issue of the matter, 
and didn't want to embarrass Jesus or himself. So he took Jesus aside and rebuked him. And the word rebuke is very strong. Rebuke takes us quite by surprise. It's very sharp, cutting, biting. No friend of Jesus had ever rebuked him in this way over his teaching. Or as far as we know, would ever again. Now, there's no doubt that Peter's rebuke was presumptuous from a disciple to a rabbi. Wow, that would have been enough to get you kicked out of school. Especially when you consider the rabbi as Jesus. He revealed himself to be the Messiah. When he heard for the first time that it comes as a distinct shock certainly revealed that Peter had a wrong idea of what Messiahship was all about. He had mentioned, you know, all of this as it involved Jesus, and it equally uh, certainly showed that he had the wrong idea of his own importance and understanding. By the way, have any of us ever sought to be God's counselor? God, I know what's best. How come you don't know what's best for me, God? I want to do this. God, you know, you know, who of us have been God's counselor? Isaiah asked that question. Paul asked that question. When Jesus talked about suffering and death, the disciples must have thought, how can he even hope to accomplish what he's outlined if that's the case? They find his words unbelievable. They're startled, amazed, mystified. So finally, Peter takes him off and rebukes him. And in that rebuke of Peter, according to the words of Matthew, you find the basic philosophy of the world stated very precisely. Spare yourself. Take care of number one. Keep yourself straight. Nothing's more important than you. That's what lies behind this. This is not the way men live. I'll give anything except my own interests. Nothing is more important than I am. This is the way men live. And Peter is reflecting that, isn't he? You know, this goes against my interests. He could even say of himself, Jesus, this goes against my interest. You see, my interest lies in the fact that you're going to rule. You're going to sit on a throne, and I'm going to rule with you. That's where my interest lies. So, Jesus, don't even go down that road. What happens when the Word of God comes up against your own personal interests? Do you cling to your own personal interests with such force and tenacity? that you miss what God wants? Or are you willing to lay your interest down at his feet and puck up his own? We all feel the pressure of this philosophy upon us. Think of yourself first. Take care of number one. Provide for yourself. Nobody else is going to do it. No one else is more important than you. You can't trust anybody to look out for your interests, so you've got to do it yourself. We all feel the weight and the pressure of that. How that attitude underlies everything, you know, that we see in entertainment, on TV, or read in magazines, or other media. The whole advertising system of our day is built upon it. You deserve the best. You deserve this vacation. You deserve this. You deserve that. Here, take this piece of plastic and go get it and get it now because you deserve it yesterday. Think of yourself. But this attitude is anything but Christ-like. What does this Christ-like attitude look like? Well, it, it, it's pretty simply this. Let this attitude be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. He begins that by saying, Do nothing out of selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind. Let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. 
have this attitude in yourself, which is also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he emptied himself and took upon himself the form of a bondservant, even as a man. And coming in the appearance of man, he was obedient to God unto all things, even unto death, which was the death of the cross. Well, this is the attitude. Look at what it says. Who, although he existed in the form of God, divine, almighty God, didn't regard equality with God something to be grasped. In other words, he was willing to let go of that for a season in order to do what was necessary for you and me. He emptied himself. He boxed up his divinity, if you will, all of his glory, all of his divine nature. He boxed it all up and he put it off in the corner and refused to act upon it. And taking the form of a bonser, being made in the likeness of man, being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Think about it. Now, if Jesus was like us, we'd say, no way, Father, uh-uh, no way. I'm number one. I'm most important. You're, I'm not going to empty myself. I'm not going to give up all the riches of glory. I'm not going to give up all my divine nature. I'm not going to pack it away for a season to go down and live with a bunch of miserable people in the filth of their sin. Leave alone to, 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 to be beat by them and abused by them and killed by them. You see the difference? Are we a disciple of Jesus? If you are, you have to share the mindset of his thinking. Consider people more important than yourself. Put others ahead of you. I don't know how many of us, or you know, maybe there's a lot like me, from time to time you say things and then you think, oh, why did I say that? I should have thought before I spoke. <laughs> Somebody told me one time I ought to carry salt around in my pocket so I could salt my foot. It'll go in the mouth and taste better. Where do I inherit that tendency? Well, friends, it goes as far back as Peter and probably farther than that. Why did Peter reject this truth to the Messiah's suffering and death and go as far as to rebuke the Master? The one that he has just recognized as God? Simply, he didn't like what Jesus said. It didn't line up with what he wanted. It didn't conform to Peter's worldview, nor uh, to his human viewpoint. Be careful. Each one of us need to be careful that we don't let our interests and our agendas supersede his. And when they come in conflict, it better be ours that we lay down. Sherry says, and it's not re really in my best interest. He has the only best plan, and that's right. Am I willing to subjugate my agenda, my plans, for his? At this point, Peter wasn't. He gets there. Are we? Father, I thank you. I thank you for the lessons that you teach us in very simple ways. I, I thank you that we can look like we did yesterday in Bible study at Peter's failures and uh, realize how often you use his failures to teach us so that we don't walk in that same path. But even after his failures, Lord, you picked him up, you dusted him off, and you used him greatly. As you will us, if we'll own those failures and give them up to you and lay them at your feet. We know that you love us beyond measure. As we said yesterday, you profoundly care about each and every one of us. Oh, that's a thought that still just kind of grips my heart. That, Lord, we couldn't record the many thoughts that you have for us. And how deeply, deeply you care for us. 
God, thank you. When I step in Peter's shoes, Lord, and I think I know best, I pray that you will be just as loving toward me as you were Peter and rebuke me and bring me back to an understanding that you know best. Might I be faithful, Lord, every day to, and, and, and all the way through the day, Lord, to continue to just lay things down at your feet and give up on my agenda and my plan and, and make sure that everything I want in my life is centered in you. To go back to that verse we looked at, whatever we eat, whatever we drink, whatever we do, do it all for the glory of God, that, Lord, that your glory be more important to us than our agendas. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for guiding and leading us, Holy Spirit. And I pray that we have had ears to hear. And that, Lord, we can adjust our life. We can examine our life in light of that and see if there's anywhere that we are casually drawing you off to the side and silently rebuking you because it doesn't fit into our view. Might you be blessed in us today, Lord. Might we live our life in a way that just exalts you, letting people know that there is a living Christ, a living Lord, a living God who loves us. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Joy being with you this morning, and I pray that you have had a great morning and that you have a great day and that God just pours his blessing abundantly out on each of you. God bless. And those of you who aren't feeling well, get better. We want you to be well. God bless. Love you. Pray for one another. Reach out. Love one another for loves of God. We'll see you tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock. We'll pick up here and go right on forward.